righty. Well, hey everyone, we are live. I think let's make sure real quick. Let us know in the chat if you can see us. Okay. Uh, and if you can hear us. Okay. Also make sure I turn down the volume. Uh, let's see one more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're good to go. We're live. All right, Ryan, you want to kick it off? Yeah, today we have our first wor workshop, which is going to be given by uh, Felix. Uh, Felix is a senior software engineer at Very Good Ventures. Uh, he created the Block State Management Library, um, which is also considered a Flutter favorite uh, by Google. And he's here to teach us about uh, Block and Qubit. Awesome. awesome. Hey, hey, everyone. Real yep. quick, I just want to say, uh, you know, if you're in the live chat, we'll be keeping an eye out for questions for Felix, who's going to be kind of screen sharing and stuff like that. We're going to maybe try and fit in a couple minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, yeah, but Felix, sure. I may hop in and, and just kind of relay questions to you. Yeah, just feel free to stop me. Stop me at any time with questions. Cool. Awesome. awesome. So I will, uh, yeah, we'll turn it over to Felix. Get started. Can everyone see the, the slides? Let me full screen this. Look good? Yeah, it looks like it uh, looks good to me. We'll keep an eye out in the chat. Just let okay. us know in the okay. chat if anyone can see. Yeah, let me know if anyone's having problems seeing. So hi, everyone. My name is Felix. Um, and uh, yeah, as was just mentioned, we're going to be talking about Block and how Block loves Qubit. If you don't know what Qubit is, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll get to that very soon. Um, and um, a little bit about myself. Um, I, as was mentioned as well, I'm a senior software engineer at Very Good Ventures in Chicago. Um, and at VGV, we basically do anything Flutter, anything Flutter related. So we're a Flutter consultancy. If you need anything from build an app from scratch in Flutter to training in Flutter, you name it, um, check out VGV if you're interested to learn more. And in terms of today's talk, um, there are a couple topics that I wanted to cover. So the first is going to be obviously what's new in Block 6.0. So if, uh, if you're an existing Block user and you haven't upgraded yet, uh, we'll try to cover some of the main things that have changed. Um, then we'll jump into what this qubit thing is and how it fits into block. Um, I'll try to talk a little bit about when to use one versus the other, which has been a hot topic. And we'll try to do some live coding at the very end where we're going to build what I've called the Fluttersaurus. Um, so hopefully we'll get to all of this because it's kind of ambitious. So let's get started. Um, in terms of changes, uh, there haven't been too many breaking changes. I know that there have been uh, frequent version bumps in the past few months, but um, hopefully it'll all be justified once, you, once we get through this uh, presentation. So the first one uh, is a pretty simple one, but it impacts everyone. And it's just that the initial state of uh, blocks has been changed to be passed via the super, um, uh, the super class instead of this override on the getter, which you might have been used to if you're using block uh, previously. And so it's a simple change, and it's a little safer, also a little less code. Uh, so if you're upgrading, that's kind of the first thing that you'll probably encounter. Um, moving on, there have been a couple of testing improvements. So if you're a big block test user and you're writing unit tests for your block, which I highly recommend, um, there's some things to hopefully make your life easier. So I'll go through line by line and talk about some of the differences. So previously, Every block test, uh, you had to define the type of the block, event, and state, uh, which was quite a lot of typing if you wanted to be very strict on your on what types are being used uh, in your Dart code. And so we've removed the event type because it's kind of um, not necessary for the scope of tests. So that's one change. Um, second, and more importantly, in my opinion, is the build and act. Previously, were required to be async, and now build is actually required to be synchronous, and act can optionally be, optionally be asynchronous. And so um, that simplifies uh, some typing as well as like some complexity of like, oh, why is this async? Like we're just returning a block. Um, I won't get into the reasons why that was async to begin with, but it's no longer necessary. And uh, you can just go ahead and follow the newer syntax and you should be um, good to go. In terms of everything else, um, pretty much nothing really major has changed aside from um, these like small remove event and async keyword. Um, moving on, we have the rename from block delegate to block observer. So this change was made to kind of align more with naming conventions that people who are in Flutter might be used to, as well as to also better communicate what the functionality of this class is. And so uh, we felt observer was a lot more appropriate. So it's a simple rename. Instead of extending block delegate, you extend block observer. Um, 
And another change that has to do with the block delegate observer uh, class is the on error override, which you might be familiar with, that you can override to intercept any errors. Uh, previously, it accepted a block, but now since block and qubit are interopping, um, it accepts a qubit. And so it's just a rename on uh, the on error callback to pass a qubit instead of a block. Otherwise, everything else has stayed the same in terms of block observer and block delegate. And so the last bit of this saga for block observer and delegate is how do you actually initialize it? So previously, there was this concept called block supervisor, which was confusing and unnecessary. And so we removed that concept altogether. And now you can just set your observer um, for the block via block.observer and then pass the instance of the block observer you want to be used. So less code, fewer concepts, um, and hopefully easier to understand. Um, another thing, if you're following me on Twitter, and you, you might have seen this the other day, uh, there are some cool uh, tooling improvements, mainly in VS Code right now, but hopefully Android Studio is just around the corner. Um, so there's improved support for um, interopting with freezed, equatable, um, when you're creating new blocks or qubits. And my favorite new feature is this code actions for VS Code, where you can wrap an existing widget in a block builder or a block provider or a block listener. And you don't have to kind of like use stream builder maybe and then like replace everything or like manually nest everything yourself. So hopefully it's a, a productivity booster there. And like I said, it should hopefully be coming to Android Studio and IntelliJ products soon. Um, I didn't cover all the changes, obviously, that would have taken probably the whole time that I have. But if you want to learn more about all of the um, things you need to do to migrate, definitely check out the official docs. There's a migration page which walks through version by version, what are the changes, why were they made, and then how do you upgrade. And so hopefully, if you have any questions, they'll be answered um, at this link. So yeah, definitely check it out if you're migrating from an older version. And so. Now let's get into uh, the interesting stuff, which is what is this qubit thing? And so if I had to give you like a one sentence definition of what qubit is, qubit is just block minus events. And so I have side by side a little illustration of block and qubit. And so if we take a look at them, both of them look very, very similar, right? Both of them are emitting states to the UI and both of them are reacting to changes in the UI, but it's just the mechanism in which they're reacting that's different. So with block, the UI is adding events, and then the block is asynchronously processing, processing those events and then updating uh, and pushing out new states. Whereas with qubit, we don't have events anymore. And so the UI is directly invoking functions that we're going to define on our qubits. And so it's a little simpler, um, one less concept that you have to deal with. I'll talk about the pros and cons in a minute. But at a high level, it's literally just block minus events. So just think about that anytime you're thinking about what is qubit. Uh, and hopefully, everything should make sense. So let's look at some code. Um, we'll take the infamous counter example that everyone <laughs> loves and take a look at what that looks like in qubit form. So nothing crazy here. You notice the new syntax where we're passing the initial state uh, via the superclass to the superclass. Um, and then we don't have a map event to state that you might be used to when you're using block. Uh, instead, we're just defining our own method. In this case, it's just called increment. And then we're using the new emit keyword to basically say, I want to push a new state. And we're going to access the current state via the state property, which is the same as it is in block, um, and then add one to the current state. So basically, if we put them side by side, um, if we go line by line, everything is exactly the same minus the events. So block, we have to we have to extend block versus qubit. We have to define this counter event up here, right? And then instead of defining our own method and having uh, this emit that we can use to push new states, we override map event to state and we're transforming events into states. So hopefully this gives, um, gives everyone a good picture of like, what do they look like side by side? What, am I, um, what do I mean by block minus events? It's just take block and strip out everything that has anything to do with an event and you're left with qubit. Um, so, this is my attempt at uh, explaining when to use one over the other. So bear with me. Um, in my opinion, qubit is great for simple um, state management. If you want a concise API, if you hate typing all the map event to state code and defining event classes and stuff like that, and you don't really see the value of doing that, then qubit is definitely what I would recommend because it takes all that complexity away and you're not dealing with async generators and streams you're literally just calling emit and passing a new state instance. Um, and so in terms of simplicity and uh, less code, qubit gets two check marks there. 
Now, Doc, on the other hand, while you do have to write more code and while it is a bit more complex, the things that you get from using Block are you get traceability. So you can tell exactly how a user got to where they got in terms of state in the application. So um, knowing like the sequence of events that led to a certain state in some cases is super, super important. Like for example, if you're managing the state of authentication in the app and somehow the user got into a state where they were logged in and then now they're no longer logged in, it's really important to figure out how they got to that state. Did they tap on a logout button and willingly or voluntarily log themselves out? Or did some sort of backend error happen? Or did they have their token revoked? All of these things are different events that could have led to the same state. And so in some cases, it's super important to know that. And you get that by using Block. Uh, another benefit of Block is you can easily integrate ReactiveX operators like buffering, throttling, debouncing. Uh, switch mapping, all that stuff um, interops uh, really well with Block, and you can get really complex if you want to. So it's more of an advanced use case, but it's a lot easier to apply that to Block than it is to Qubit. Um, but uh, otherwise, across the board, in terms of if you're looking for a testable, scalable uh, solution that has tooling support and everything, all of them check the boxes. And that's part of the reason why they were merged together into one ecosystem, as opposed to having Qubit packages and Block packages. We really wanted to have a consolidated um, ecosystem with unified tooling and, and testable um, code that anyone can basically uh, build upon at any time and, and basically write anything from a really simple application to a super complex application with like hundreds of developers and still um, be happy with your code pretty much and be confident with your code. And so now uh, let's jump into what we're actually going to be building and put some of these concepts to use. And so I mentioned in the, in the agenda that we're going to be building something called a Flutter Saurus. And so uh, if you want to follow along, you can actually go to uh, the GitHub URL down below and clone the repo. Um, at a high level, what we're building is a thesaurus. Uh, and it's going to have two features. One is we're going to be able to search for terms and get some auto completion here with suggestions. And then the second feature is going to be once I tap on one of these um, suggestions, I want to actually look up what the synonyms are for that word that I tapped on. And this is going to be a fully functioning app that hits an API. We're actually going to be using the Data Muse API. So let me escape out of here and get out of full screen and pull up GitHub. So. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, you can just follow along on GitHub if you want to. Um, there's the link to the API that we're using. It's the Data Muse API. Highly recommend checking it out. It's absolutely free to use. You don't need an API key or anything to get started. And uh, really quickly, the two endpoints that we're going to be using for this application are going to be the words endpoint. And we're going to also be using the suggestions endpoint. So the suggestions is going to be for autocomplete. Um, and the words endpoint is going to be for finding synonyms. So we're going to pass this means like query parameter to the API and the word that the user uh, selected. And then we're going to pull synonyms for that word. So enough talking about all this stuff. Let's take a look at the code. And also, one last thing I want to mention is if you're following along, uh, the master branch of this project is complete. So you can actually run it and see the fully functioning application. And there's a second branch called the starter branch, which I'm going to be on right now as I'm going through this. And that's where we're going to have like missing like holes in the application that we're going to be filling in as we go. So check out the starter branch if you want to follow along. And if you want the full solution, check out uh, master branch. So how is the size actually? Is the font size OK for everyone? Hopefully. All right, I'm going to assume yes. Tell me if it's not. Um, so. I've started it up already. So the application in the starter branch right now looks like this. Um, we have our beautiful search UI. And I can type some text in here, and nothing happens. But uh, before we get started actually making this work, I want to quickly talk about the directory structure in the application and hey, what parts really? are there right now. So the most important directories are the lib, obviously. And then we have this packages directory. And I'm going to start with packages because it's kind of the inner workings of the application. So the lowest layer of our application is this data muse is using this data muse API package. And the data muse API package is just a Dart wrapper around the data muse REST API that I just showed. And so it gives us um, the ability to query for words, hit the suggestions endpoint, and it's literally just wrapping um, the HTTP requests that are made and then deserializing the response from the API. It has no other functionality, and it has nothing 
app specific in it. It's just a wrapper. And we could have even published this to uh, pub.dev and you could have pulled it in as a dependency in your pub spec. Um, but for now, it's a local dependency. And then the second layer on top of the data muse API is what we're calling the thesaurus repository. And the, the main goal of this layer is to basically abstract where the data is coming from and how we're getting the data from the rest of the application. And so the thesaurus repository, in our case, uses the data muse API client internally, but it's exposing a simplified uh, interface that we're going to be working with in the rest of the application. And it's not leaking any of the implementation details of how we're getting the data. Is it data muse data or whatever? So at any point in time, we should be able to change from using data muse to a different backend or read from local file or whatever we want to do. And this layer is going to help us achieve that because everything above this layer is not going to know about what's below. Um, and so we can swap out implementations easily. And so the hey, simple Felix, yeah. yep. Hey, can we make the font size just a little bit bigger? Yes. Hopefully Thank you. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, let me know if it's, it's still sure. too small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Cool. Thank um, you. Yep, and so the simplified API that we've exposed in the repository is just, I want to be able to search for a term, and I want to get a list of strings back for suggestions. And I want those suggestions to be ordered by relevance, so the top one should be the most relevant, the bottom one should be the least relevant. Uh, and then similarly, I want an API where I can look up synonyms. And I don't care how we get those synonyms or where they come from, I just want a way to look up synonyms for a given word, and again, just get a list of strings back. And so that, that's what the role of this thesaurus repository is. And so now if we jump to the Flutter application, the flutter source pubspec.yaml actually only has a dependency on the thesaurus repository. So it doesn't know anything about data muse, and it doesn't know uh, how we're getting the data or that we're hitting REST APIs. Cannot stress that enough. Um, it's all just interfacing with the thesaurus repository. And so let's just walk through um, what we have so far. So just like every other Flutter app that you've seen, probably uh, we have a main.dart, which is the entry point, And we're configuring some um, uh, global configuration. So for example, this is just helping us have more uh, readable logs uh, that we're going to be uh, seeing as we're building out our application. Excuse me. And then the second line is going to be uh, setting up our block observer, which I mentioned is using the new syntax or the new changes. Uh, so like the on-air is using a qubit. And we're just printing um, anytime any of these hooks are triggered so that we can see logs in our debug console. So nothing crazy there. Um, and the important thing is now we're creating this Flutter source widget. And the Flutter source widget is kind of like the root for our entire application. And it has a dependency on the thesaurus repository. And so if we jump into Flutter source, it's just a stateless widget. It requires a thesaurus repository. It's going to yell at us if we don't pass one, because it's absolutely necessary. And the very first thing it does is it provides this the source repository to the entire uh, material app so that we can access it via build context anywhere. And this will come in handy later on. Uh, we have some basic theming, uh, nothing crazy, pretty minimal. And then we have two features. So we have the search feature, um, and then we have the synonyms feature. And those are correlating one-to-one -one with the directory structure on the left. So we have a search feature and a synonyms feature. Each of these have view associated with them and some models or one model associated with them. Um, and so let's start with the search. The search is what we're looking at right now. Um, and if I look at the view, it's basically just a scaffold with some uh, filler, some image. Um, and then we have the form, which is going to be handling the input uh, from the user. And if I jump into the form, the form is basically consisting of a search bar and some content. The search bar right now tells us that the search term has changed as we're typing. So like if I type cat, we'll get notified that I've typed cat, but we're not doing anything with that information. And then uh, the search content right now is just hard coded to always return this placeholder uh, down below, this some or this fine fancy words placeholder. Uh, but we do have pre-built widgets for a successful search a loading, a search loading, and um, yeah, we're going to implement all that right now. And so this is where we're basically going to build a block for our feature. So I'm going to use the VS Code extension. If you don't have it, um, you can just search block. Um, it's huge, but yeah, just block. It's on 5.1.1 right now. 
And I can now, if I have this extension installed, just right click on my folder uh, and do block new block and come up with a name for the block. So I'm just gonna call this the search block. So the name of the block is just search and automatically we'll get a block folder created for us. And then we'll have an event um, class, a state class and the block file itself. And now for the sake of time, I'm not going to type out everything because I think it's not as beneficial and will also take too long. So I'm just gonna talk through um, some of the changes. So I'm gonna start with the state. The search state that we're gonna be modeling um, is pretty much gonna consist of two pieces of information. What's the status? Like, are we in the process of fetching data? Have we fetched data or have we gotten an error fetching the data? And then what are the suggestions, if any, that we want to display to the user? And so uh, in order to fix these errors, I'm going to export block, search block that we just created. Um, and so now coming back to our search, I can import the suggestions. Uh, let's just import. And so, um, yeah, so pretty much it's just gonna consist of suggestions and a status. And we have some convenience constructors um, to make it really uh, clear what each state is. So in our initial state, the status is initial and we have no suggestions. In the loading state, the status is loading. Again, we have no suggestions. For success, we accept some suggestions and we pre-populate everything. And then failure, we don't pass any error, but we could pass an optional like reason for the failure. Um, and so that's all there is to the state really. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit save. And now we can come back to our block. Um, actually, let's jump, let's jump to the event first. So the event that we're gonna be responding to in this case is just gonna be a single event called search term changed. Um, so let me just drop that in as well so that you don't watch me type. And so the search term changed event is going to take the raw text that we've typed into the form and it's just gonna uh, notify the block. Hey, the user has changed the search term. Here's the new term, nothing crazy there. And so now if I save that up and come to our block, this is where things will get interesting. So I can go ahead and replace our initial state with search state.initial. And then there are some things we need to do, right? First, we need to import the thesaurus repository because our block is gonna be working with the thesaurus repository. Um, my imports are being crazy, but ignore that for now. Um, this should just be packages. The VS Code sometimes like freaks out on me. So this should be here. I might need to restart VS Code potentially, but let's see how it goes. Actually, yeah, let me quickly restart because this is gonna be a pain um, if it continues messing with the imports. I'm going to just rerun the app. Oh, come on, VS Code. Bear with me. Analyzing. Oh, let's build anyway. Let me get rid of that import and see if it resolves properly now. Yeah, there it is. Sometimes it just has trouble. Um, but it's launching. So anyway, let's keep coding while it's launching. Um, so we have an instance of the repository. We need to actually inject it into the constructor and we can be safe and throw an assertion error if the source repository is not null because it absolutely should never uh, be null. And what is it complaining about for right now? <laughs> Probably because I had errors while I was running this. Um, and anyway, and so now we just need to handle the events. So we can handle if the event is search term changed, we need to do stuff. Um, so first, wh what are we gonna do? We need to actually tell the user something is happening, right? So we can yield uh, search state loading, right? So that's gonna indicate to the user, hey, something is happening. And then we can safely, by using a try catch, yeah, our app is coming back. Um, we can safely in our try catch make a request to the thesaurus repository, thesaurus repository, and perform the search, right? This has nothing to do with data muse. We don't even know that data muse exists at this point. And we can access the term from the event, right? Because we're passing the term. And so this is going to give us uh, some results. Right? So we're calling search. Let me throw a comma in here so that this formats a little better and you can read it. 
And now we need to basically convert this list of strings into search into a search state. So we can yield search state dot success. And our success takes a list of suggestions. Um, and the reason I did this was to show that typically you'll have to do some like massaging of the data that you get from the repository. Uh, and you probably want to actually make it convenient to use in the UI. So it's usually not going to be exactly the same as the format um, in which you get from the repository. And so we'll do some normalization by uh, going through the results and mapping each result into a suggestion. Um, and this is super trivial right now, but uh, this is just to show that you will likely have to do some sort of normalization. Um, and this is typically where you would probably do that. So uh, hopefully everyone can read that. We're basically going through every result and we're building a suggestion, which is going to be the model that our UI is going to be working with. Um, and then we're emitting a success state with the suggestions. In case of a failure, uh, right now for simplicity, I'm not actually like putting any failure reason in there. Where I'm just going to emit the search state dot failure, but you can also have access to the error in the stack trace in here if you want to log things, right? Like you could catch their stack trace and do stuff with it, but for simplicity, we're not going to deal with that right now. And so we have our block, right? This is everything that we needed for the search block. We had the state defined, the events defined, um, and then we've implemented any time we get a search term changed, we output a loading state, and then we try to do a bunch of stuff. One thing that I'm actually missing is the case where uh, if the term is empty, that means that the user has cleared out their selection. And so here we can just yield a search state initial because we want to show the initial placeholder UI. And then we can return early so that none of the remaining code gets executed. So if our search term is empty, the state becomes initial. Otherwise, the state becomes loading. We make the asynchronous request to fetch suggestions. We mold our suggestions into the model that we want to present. And then we output that state to the user. And so now what would this look like in the UI? We're done with our block. So let's take a look at in the search form where we're going to need to actually have access to this. We can use the VS Code extension, wrap it in a block provider, and say this is going to be a search block, um, import Flutter block. And now search block requires the source repository. So we can look it up via context. Thesaurus. Thesaurus is such a long word. Cool. And now we're basically uh, checking off this to do, which is providing the search block to the widget that needs it or the subtree that needs it. Um, and so now in our search form, we can do stuff with the block. So in unchanged, we can look up the block, search block. Um, let's import Flutter block, the extensions don't get auto-recognized, unfortunately. Um, and so we can look up the block. And then anytime the search term changes, we can add an event, search term changed, and pass the term. Uh, and so now we are uh, hooking up. Every time I type a character, you can see down below in the debug console, uh, if I can expand it, um, we are getting events. Right, search term changed, SDAS, SDASD, as the blah, 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 blah. Right, let me type something more meaningful in. Let's do cat. There we go. So we're notifying our block, but we're not actually listening to the response of the block. And so where we probably want to do that is here in the search content widget. Right now, it's always hard coded to return some fancy words, uh, but we can, this can no longer be const. And we can wrap it in a block builder. Um, oops, that got messed up. And then uh, this is going to be our search block and search state. And so now uh, we don't always want to return a new uh, or a search initial widget. We want to actually do something when the state of the block is changing, which is what block builder is designed for. And so now we can easily switch on the status. And we can just start enumerating so in the case of loading right so if the search status uh, is loading what do we want to do we want to use the beautiful pre-made loading widget that I 
graciously made uh, success that success you can also use freezed or whatever you want uh, here so that you're not switching you can just use um, when or maybe when if you're using listeners um, so feel free to put your own spin on this this is just keeping it simple uh, so in the case of success we can uh, return search results and search results require suggestions and our suggestions are part of our state so that works out nicely and I need to return this. Uh, and then um, for everything else for now, let us just return this guy. So if it's not loading and it's not success, we're going to return our initial. And so immediately you can see, A, we're getting some auto-completion functionality working, right? Let's do this again. Let's type flutter. And we get flutter, fluttering, fluttery. Um, all these suggestions for what I might have been searching for, or if I start typing like the word uh, car, uh, we, we get like maybe cat, maybe car, maybe whatever, um, and the suggestions keep updating in real time. Now there's one problem that we have immediately, which you're probably noticing is like every time I type, we go to the loading state and it flickers uh, and it kind of looks weird. So let's fix that quickly by going into the block. In the block, we're always emitting a loading state, but what we could do is we could check if the state's status uh, was already or, or was not already a successful status. So if we aren't coming from a successful state, then uh, yield a loading. Otherwise, don't yield the loading. So if we already have some results, then just keep adding to those results, but don't switch back to the loading state and make it like really jarring and, and weird for the user, right? So now it looks a little better. But here's another problem. Literally every time I type a character, I'm making an API call, which is not only inefficient, but it's also potentially expensive if you're hitting a paid uh, API or if you're uh, hosting your own backend. And so I talked about one of the advantages of Block being that uh, you have an integration of advanced reactive operators like Dbounce. And so let's show, or let's take a look at how you would use some of those. Uh, so let's show how we could Dbounce here. We can basically override this transform events method. And transform events allows us to manipulate the incoming events before they actually go to map event to state. So um, instead of returning the default, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the events that are coming in. I'm going to uh, import Rx Dart, <laughs> which I already have in my project. Uh, but you can add it as a dependency if you don't. Um, and then I'm going to use debounce time. And now let's see, what do we want? Let's just give it milliseconds, uh, milliseconds, 300. And then uh, let's also apply switch map. So what switch map is going to do is allow us to basically ignore any previous events and always process only the latest event. And then the transition function uh, says, OK, pass this on to map event to state. So we're modifying our events by applying a debounce and also switch mapping. So we're all, always only processing the most recent one. Um, and now if I do a hot restart, uh, hot restart, there we go. And now if I type flutter, notice it's not instantly searching. It actually pauses for a second before searching. And if I'm deleting, it's not instantly deleting, it's pausing for a second. So that's how we apply the debounce operation to a, our block. And we did it in very few lines of code. And um, yeah, it's hidden away from the UI so we can reuse this uh, in other apps or other parts of the app. And it's nicely tucked away and easy to test as well, which we might have time to get to. So now the last thing is we have our search functionality, right? So let me do cat. And if I tap on cat, um, I actually want something to happen when I tap on it. Um, and yeah, so let's let's build that out. We're getting some exceptions right now, which is cool. Uh, so let's take a look at what happens when I actually tap on one. So in the search results widget, um, we have an on tap that gets called. And here in my on tap, we basically need to do some uh, some navigation. So let me steal some code from the completed one so that we're not watching me type. Um, doo -doo -doo. Where am I here? One second, bear with me. Uh, 
Oh, I skipped I skipped a whole <laughs> no wonder this is looking super weird to me. Uh, I skipped a whole widget. So we shouldn't be dealing with the search results widget. We should be dealing with the search success widget, uh, which uses search results, but search results stays super agnostic. Um, and it can be reused in other parts of our app. So search success down below uh, handles the navigation for us. And so now if I tap on cat, we're going to the synonyms page and we're passing the word that we've tapped on, so cat. And we are just showing a loading indicator. Um, but this is where we now need to make another request to the back end and get synonyms for the word. And so this is where you probably guess we're going to use a qubit. Um, so we use a block for search so that we can get the advantage of the debounce. Uh, but now in the case of synonyms, we're just going to make a single request to the back end and fetch some data and, and show it. And so there's less of a need to have a block. And so I'm just going to, again, use the VS Code extension, qubit, new qubit. We're going to call it synonyms. And then VS Code will do the work for us to create the qubit. Um, and I will swap out the state so that you don't watch me type again. The state is going to look very similar to uh, the block state. You'll see in a second. Um, first thing I always forget to do is export it. So give me one second. This is just so that the imports um, resolve properly and everything looks nice. Uh, so synonyms. Cool. So now the synonym state looks very similar to the search state. We have a status. Um, we're defaulting to loading, which is why you see this beautiful shimmer from the shimmer package. Um, and then again, we have two pieces of information on our state, the status and then the content itself, uh, which is a list of synonym, uh, which is our own custom model that we've defined, again, just for this feature. So it has nothing to do with the thesaurus repository. Um, it, we're in full control of it for this use case for this feature. And then we have three convenience constructors, again, loading, success, and failure. So now we didn't have to define any event. Um, uh, this is difference number one. And then uh, synonym state.initial is going to be our, or not initial, loading is going to be our initial state. Oh. And again, just like with the, um, with the search block, I'm going to pass it the source repository. Source repository, we're going to initialize it. Same deal as before. Um, we can assert that the thesaurus repository is not null. And now, instead of map event to state, we can just define a very simple um, method. And our method is going to be async called get synonyms, right? And get synonyms is going to take a required um, word. Um, We'll import from foundation for now, but it's OK. And so uh, now in get synonyms, it's going to be very similar to the search block. We need to first tell the user something is happening in case they were in a different state before. So we're going to use the emit keyword this time, because we're in qubit. And we can emit whatever state we want to react to in the UI. So we can emit synonyms state dot loading. So as soon as get synonyms is called, we're putting our qubit in a loading state. And then similarly to the search block, we're going to have a try catch. In the try, we're going to, instead of calling the search API, we're going to call the synonyms API. This time, we don't have an event that we're pulling a property off of. We're just passing it directly. So passing that in, we can await that whole thing since it's a future, store the result. And then now, again, we have our little like fake normalization step that I put in just to show what it might look like. So we're going to convert what we get from the repo, which is strings, into the model that we want in the UI, which are uh, synonyms. So synonyms equals, and then results.map. For each result, we're going to create a synonym. And the synonym is going to take just the result string for now. And so we have our synonyms. Let me format this a little better so you can read it, even though it's kind of ugly. And then now we can, again, just emit. And we want to emit our success state. So synonyms, uh, synonyms state dot success. There's so many. And we're going to pass the completed uh, list of synonyms. And then in the case of the failure, we are going to emit not success, but failure. And we don't need synonyms. And that can be const. So our qubit looks awfully similar to our block. 
Um, but we've defined our own method on there. And so I'm going to try to speed through and hook this up so that we get to a point where everything is working. So um, similar to before, in our synonyms page, we need to provide the synonyms qubit. Uh, so let's wrap the view with a block provider, synonyms, and then I can press tab and pick qubit. Um, I can import Flutter block, and again, it needs a thesaurus repository, so I can look it up via the build context, thesaurus repository. Now there's one slight difference here. Um, we're not ever really telling our qubit, we're not ever really calling get synonyms anywhere right now. So we can call get synonyms right here. Um, since we have the word that the uh, synonyms page was instantiated with. And so what that's going to do is say like, hey, synonyms qubit, as soon as you're created, immediately fetch synonyms for the word, word, underscore word. And that way, uh, we'll kick off that request as soon as possible. And you don't need to create a stateful widget with init state um, to just make this get synonyms call. You can do it at the time of creation if you want that to happen, if you want it to immediately fetch when you're creating it. And so now in synonyms view, uh, we need to react to state changes. So uh, let's, again, wrap this in a block builder. Come on, VS Code, don't fail me. There we go. Block builder. Uh, of course. That's a bug. Um, and so synonyms qubit. Uh, Flutter block gets imported. And so now we don't want to always return a synonyms loading widget. Uh, we have a couple of widgets to choose from. We have a successful, successful widget. We have a loading widget, which we're returning right now. We have a failure widget. So if an error happens, we can render one. Um, and so let's just, again, switch on state.status. And then if it's synonyms uh, status dot, let's just uh, do yeah, let's do loading. We'll return loading. Oh. And then let's do the success. Synonyms status success. We'll return synonyms success. And now here, the success widget takes, you guessed it, the synonyms, which we have on the state, just like before with the suggestions. And then for everything else, we're just going to assume that something went wrong if it's neither of those two. And we're going to do synonyms failure. And this could be const. Oops. And so can the loading. Cool. So now, if I, oh, if I hot restart because my app is in a weird state uh, and type cat and tap on cat, we made the request for synonyms. While we were making it, we showed the loading screen. As soon as the status updated to success, we showed the synonyms success widget, which rendered this list of synonyms. Um, and so everything is hooked up properly now. The only thing that we're not handling is in the main screen, um, in the search screen here. If an error happens, you'll notice here we have a widget that we're showing. But on the search screen, if an error, ha if an error happens, Let's say our UI team or our designers said that we want to just show a snack bar. We don't want to actually show some sort of UI. So we can come back to the search page, um, go into the search form. And then here, where we're using a block builder to react to uh, state changes and build different widgets, we can actually um, wrap this in a block listener and then search block. And then here, we can say if the state status equals search status dot failure. Then we can do scaffold and then show us that. Let me just copy this code because there's no point in watching me type it. Bah, bah, bah. Hey, Felix. Yep. Hey, we are at 11.47, at least my time. Uh, oh, it looks like you're the same time. Uh, we yep, want to yep. leave a couple of minutes for questions. questions. How does, okay, I'll wrap how up does, quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, well, I think <laughs> like five minutes from now. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me just finish the snack bar bit. So snack bar, we're just going to put some generic content, text, uh, whatever. Something went wrong. And what is it yelling about? 
snack bar with a capital B. This can all be const. So um, yeah, the, the concept I wanted to cover really quickly is now the snack bar is gonna get shown um, in response to state changes in the block, but it's not gonna be lumped in with UI changes. So the builder should typically just be used to return widgets, only return widgets, and it should be a pure function which has no side effects. If you want side effects, th like things that should happen only one time, in response to state changes, you can use a block listener. And in this case, I have a situation where I have a nested builder inside of a listener. And so I can actually uh, collapse this into a block consumer. And then I can remove my build, my block builder because they're all the same and refactor. And now we have the exact same thing as before, just one less uh, level of indentation. So we can handle state changes uh, and do side effects or perform side effects. And then we can handle state changes and render UI. Um, and we can get uh, creative and um, actually I'll stop there since we're low on time. Um, I was gonna talk about testing, but I will instead just uh, save some time for questions. And in the master repo of Flutter source, you can see um, everything has tests. So you, I highly recommend checking out how the blocks and qubits are tested as well as how the UI is tested. Um, everything should be uh, comprehensively tested. So if it isn't open a pull request or an issue, and then um, also these slides are part of the repo as well. So if you go into slides and then go to the PDF, block plus qubit PDF, you'll have a copy of the slides themselves. So I will stop there and then open it up for questions. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Hey. All righty. So I think Ryan is going to join us here in a sec. Do you want to stop sharing your screen and we can... Yes, uh, I will stop sharing. We can see a full screen. Cool. Uh, all righty. So Ryan, do you want to kick off with some questions? And if anyone has uh, any question, other questions that came up, uh, you know, we're watching the chat as well. So let us know. Yeah, sure. So it um, looks like we have three questions. Uh, the first one is from, and I apologize if I mess up anybody's name. Uh, the first one is from Jasper Santos. He asks, uh, will block JS have a future update in uh, React JS? It's a great question. Uh, so I'll give some quick context to block JS. Actually, uh, as some of you probably know, uh, block, the block library was actually created while I worked at BMW. Uh, before I joined Very Good Ventures. And there I had the privilege of working with some awesome interns who really love JavaScript and React. And they were like, well, let's try to port this to JavaScript. And so that's actually how Block.js was born. And so we never actually used it for anything in production, although I do know some people who are using it in production. Um, and so it's always kind of taken a, a, whatever, a seat in the back. It hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. So I will try to keep it up to date, but obviously like everything is really time consuming and I'm trying to focus on documentation for um, all the tutorials and examples at this point. Um, but I think once things hopefully settle down with the Dart ecosystem, I will turn my attention over to the JavaScript one as well. And I encourage PRs and issues from anyone. So if you really think it'd be useful in your project, please open a PR and I'm more than happy to review PRs and work with people. It's just, I only have so much time, unfortunately, that I can dedicate to it, so great question. All right, uh, next question is from Gandhi Richard. Uh, he, uh, he says he noticed that you were using factory methods a lot and he was wondering if that was just a personal preference or if there were performance implications there. Um, so I was using name constructors. You could also use factories. And the reason I did it was to be very strict about the configurations of the states themselves. And so I, yeah, I think that uh, you don't have to use them. It's, it is definitely a, a personal preference thing. Some people um, prefer to use factories or name constructors. You can even have static um, factories kind of if you wanted to. But uh, the main reason I chose to do that was to basically keep the API very strict so that it's impossible to, for example, create a state where you are loading but also had data or a state where you have an error but also had data, like make those combinations impossible to encounter as uh, a UI because it doesn't really make sense logically to have to handle those. And so trying to handle those is kind of pointless and extra work that we would have to do. So I wanted to 
basically just make it impossible to happen in the first place. So that was the goal of having those name constructors was to really have strict control over how the different states can actually be created or like in what configuration they can be created. All right. Uh, my next question is from Surya Prakash. Uh, he asks, uh, can you tell um, what cases you should use uh, qubit instead of using block? Yeah, so um, basically, if you're not sure, my advice is start with qubit. Uh, it's less code, and it's simpler. And then you will quickly find that you need block if you do, and then you won't care if you don't, and then you'll be happy that you never started with block in the first place. So I'd say if you're unsure, start with qubit, and then you can easily scale up. The beauty is, uh, and part of the reason why we decided to merge everything together is the way that you actually work with them in the UI is almost identical, and then the way that you also test them is pretty much identical. And so if you decide, for example, like, hey, I started with a qubit, and I wasn't sure that I would need a block, and then later on, you realize, like, hey, I really want to debounce, or hey, I really want to know the events that are happening and track them, you can change your qubit to a block and have almost no changes in the UI, and it'll be a very straightforward and seamless transition, hopefully. So don't be afraid about choosing qubit and then later switching to block. It, it was designed to be easy to do that, hopefully, and maybe in the future there'll be some VS Code magic and IntelliJ magic to do that for you. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. But yeah, definitely start with qubit if you're not sure. Awesome. I basically gave that same exact answer in the awesome. lunch we learned <laughs> yesterday. So I'm glad my answer is Felix approved. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. And then the final question, uh, hopefully I get this right. Uh, Gandai, or uh, not Gandai, I think it's pronounced Zaza, asks, um, in the case where your initial state is a future, uh, how do you pass it to the initial state? Um, and the example he uses is getting an int from shared preferences when you start the application. Yeah, so that's that's something that I've actually seen people ask quite a lot. And so the short answer is you can't. Block's initial state has to be synchronous. And so there are a couple ways you can go around that. You can either um, request that information before your app starts and show the user the splash screen for a little bit longer while you access shared preferences, and then you have that piece of information available. Or if it's something more complex, then you definitely should have a loading state, and then you definitely should show the user something while you're getting that piece of information because you don't want to keep them waiting. And um, uh, so, yeah, in the case of shared preferences and you're just loading some simple um, value and it's only needed like at the very beginning, like let's say you just want to know if the user has opened the app before, that might be something that you can like pre-request in your main um, and await that before calling run app. And then you'll get the advantage of the native splash screen, uh, getting your back there and, and having the user like see something that's not just like a black screen while you get that data. And then you'll have that information ready to pass synchronously to the block. Um, or if you want to do the request within the block, you should definitely have an initial like loading state while you're processing things. So always the initial state has to be synchronous. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have nothing to tell the user while they see that UI. Awesome. I think Good that question. is. Uh, I think that is all the questions. Oh no, we have one more from Gandai. Um, okay. <laughs> he was asking about. Uh, he noticed you didn't use block consumer. Um, instead, you use block listener and block builder. And he was wondering, yeah. is that a preference? No. Yeah. Yeah. I refactored at the last second. Sorry if I was going too fast. I. My intention was to use block builder and then put a block listener on top and then show that you can combine the two. So always combine them if it makes sense. Like if you need to listen and rebuild in response to the same block, then definitely combine them and you'll save yourself some code. Um, and so I apologize if I was going too fast. I intended to show that last bit and have a bit more time to let it soak in, but maybe I went through it, I went through it too fast. So um, yeah, block consumer is great whenever you can use it. Cool. Cool, I think that's all the questions that we, um, I guess that's probably all the questions we have time for. Yeah. Um, but I would want to say, if you have any more questions, you can post them in the uh, ByteConf Flutter channel on Discord. Yes. Yeah, so we'll put another link to that. And the other thing that I just put in the chat is um, there's a page on our website, which I just linked in the chat, that has uh, all the repos that Felix mentioned, and uh, I think, like, the example repo, and then also, obviously, like, the you know actual github libraries and stuff like that so that'll be a good resource that we'll um continue to build on probably honestly after the workshop ends too we'll still add some more stuff there 
Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think we're pretty much good here. Thank you, Felix, so much for joining us. It was really interesting. Uh, you, you said that you were rushing through things, but I felt like it was the right pace, but maybe that just means that my brain is like, <laughs> really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> really I always fast. struggle with going too quickly. So hopefully people, well, the nice thing is you can rewatch it at your own pace later. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you absolutely can. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah, and thanks for having me. It was great. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the Fluttersaurus example. And yeah, reach out if you have any questions. Awesome. So we will be back, everyone, in just a couple of minutes with our next workshops. Perfect time for uh, bathroom break, coffee break, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I'll put a link to the Discord in the meantime. You know, if you have some extra time, feel free to come join our Discord server and, uh, you know, keep the conversation going there. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thanks, everyone.
guess I'll just introduce myself when, when he starts and then I guess start the workshop. Yeah, hey, so I think we should be live now. Uh, so actually, if you want to stop sharing your screen real quick and we can just see like your full, <laughs> like full video real quick. And then we can just, or is that, is that going to mess you up? Uh, well, I managed to do it last time, so <laughs> let's see. <laughs> cool. Yeah, okay, that would be great. Just, uh, I mean, everyone needs to everyone. So I guess we are on stream, so hi, hey everyone. Uh, oh, it's, people are saying the music. Yeah. Okay. I to turn it on, the volume button. Hey, there we go. So it does say, so my video is on. Uh, somehow, um, let's see. Okay. Someone says nice music, but it's still playing. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. But yeah, that's not good that it's still playing. Um, if if you are uh, unable to, like, if it's going to mess you up to do this, start or stop the screen sharing, that's okay. Um, maybe, Ryan, do you want to introduce our next, uh, our next speaker? And I'll make sure that the sound is indeed fixed and everything <laughs> like that. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the option to, to share my webcam bit, but somehow, eh, other than maybe putting it on the same desktop where everyone is. Let's it's see. All good. I think, I think we're ready to go. I think I've, I've fixed the music here. So yeah, hearing in the chat, it's okay. So uh, Ryan, do you want to introduce real quick and then we'll uh, kick it out to Andrea to do the rest of the presentation? Oh, I think you're okay. muted, Ryan. <laughs> Sorry. There, there uh, we go. Yeah, so next up we have Andrea, and he's going to be giving us a, a very introductory sort of view of Flutter. Um, he is an iOS and Flutter developer, also a blogger. Um, you can check him out on his uh, codingwithflutter.com website. Um, I know I've used it personally. I use his Firebase tutorials um, pretty much every time I start a new project. A lot of great content there. Uh, he's also a uh, Flutter GDE. Um, he offers crash courses on Udemy, and uh, he also has a YouTube channel um, that you can find on his website, but um, it's uh, Code with Andrea, and I can post all those links as well. Okay. All right, thanks for the introduction, Ryan. Um, it's actually a very nice introduction. I'm kind of looking a bit silly at the moment because I'm not managing to share my uh, webcam, but... Um, I guess maybe I'll just leave that out for now and um, I'll just talk a little bit about myself and we'll start the workshop. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining this uh, workshop. Um, uh, today I'm gonna be talking primarily about uh, Flutter forms and also explicit animations in Flutter. Um, and before I get to the main topic, um, I just want to say a couple of words about myself. Um, so I started using Flutter and making tutorials for the community around two and a half years ago. Uh, so as part of this, I created a YouTube channel uh, as well as a website where I share tutorials about uh, Dart, Flutter, and Firebase. Um, so in these two years, I've had the chance to use Flutter in client projects and also a variety of demo apps uh, that I've made available with my tutorials. And um, in today's workshop, uh, we are going to learn uh, how to work with forms in Flutter and how to use explicit animations. So uh, to do this, uh, we'll be using Dartpad. Uh, and rather than starting from scratch, uh, we have a starter project. So uh, if you are following the group chat, uh, I've shared a URL uh, which points to DartPod, and you can use that one to open it on your browser over here, and that will give you access to the same starter project that I will be using for this workshop. Um, and just, just real quick to interject, so we've put that in the YouTube live chat, and I will put that in the Discord. If you're in our Discord chat server, I'll put that there as well. So thank you for sharing that, Andre. That's really helpful. We'll make sure that everyone uh, starts there. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully everyone has access to the link. And, um, and if you can see my screen, I'm already sharing it here. 
so as I said, we'll be running all of this with Dart, but so um, because it is a starter project, uh, maybe a good way to, to start it is for me to give you a quick walkthrough of this application. Um, so starting from the top, uh, here we have uh, the main method, um, and this is uh, the entry point of our program. So what we do here, what we do here is to call run up uh, and give it the root widget of our Flutter application. And you might have heard that in Flutter everything is a widget, um, and that means that the entire application is a widget itself. So by passing this to run up, we are making sign up up the root widget of our uh, entire application. So next, we can take a look at how this one is structured. Um, so this is a stateless widget, and I talk maybe a little bit about stateless widgets and stateful widgets a little bit later. Uh, but the important thing to notice here is that whenever you subclass stateless widget or stateful widget, uh, you have to override this build method. And this is where you declare what the layout of your uh, Flutter widget looks like. Uh, so this is a simple widget that returns a material app with just one route. So um, material app is a special widget in Flutter, and we can use it to define an application uh, that uses material design. Uh, so under the hood, it does a lot of useful stuff, such as configuring a top-level navigator, as well as defining all the theming properties for our app. So uh, material app has a lot of configurable arguments, uh, but in this case, we are keeping things simple. And here we just pass our root object that contains a single route, and that is the root of our application. So uh, this route, defined like this, contains a sign up screen widget. And so we can take a look at this one. Um, so this is another stateless widget, uh, which uh, has a build method, just like the one we just seen. And it defines a scaffold, uh, which is a widget that implements the basic material uh, design visual layout structure. So you can use a scaffold to add things like an application bar at the top or a bottom navigation bar at the bottom. So um, in this case, what we do here, for example, is to define a background color, uh, which uses the color gray swatch with a value of 200. And if we wanted, we could quickly tweak this. And for example, if I change this to 400, uh, I can run the program again, and you'll see that the background now looks a little bit darker. So uh, we can put this back to 200, and I think that's enough to give us a little bit of contrast uh, against this form that is in the middle. Um, so this form that you can see here uh, is defined uh, by this um, sign up form widget uh, that you can see here. Um, and in order to position this form like this, we had to um, wrap this form with a card widget, uh, which is a widget that gives you this kind of nice rounded corner effect around these borders. And in order to, um, to lay out like this as well, uh, we, we, have, we are using a size box with a width of 400. So this will fix the width of this entire layout to 400 points. And to make things centered, uh, we are wrapping this inside a center widget. So this is just basic layout that goes around the sign-up form to make it appear in the middle uh, and with this, the, with this sizing constraints. Uh, next, we can look at the sign-up form itself. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have a stateful widget. Um, and it needs to be like this, because this widget needs to re rebuild itself when its state changes. So, um, and it's often the case, in fact, it's always the case in Flutter that when you have a stateful widget, um, you also have a companion state class, uh, which is where we define the widget's state along with its layout. So as part of this workshop, uh, we will make changes primarily to this sign up form state class. Um, so if we want, we can also take a look at the build method for this class. Um, and we can see that it defines a form uh, that we can use to be notified uh, when something changes. Um, so this form has a column, and a column is used to define a vertical layout with multiple children. Uh, so if we go in order from top to bottom, uh, looking at the layout, we can see that we have uh, this widget, which is a linear progress indicator, 
and it's like this tiny bar that you can see at the top. This is followed by a big text, uh, which is this text widget that we see over here in the code. And then we have uh, three form fields. Um, and each one is wrapped with a padding widget so that the text fields uh, don't go from edge to edge uh, within the form. And as you can see, uh, each text form field uh, has an input decoration object that we can use to define the hint text. So this is where we set the first name, last name, and username labels that you see over here. Uh, also, each one of these text form fields defines a controller. Um, and uh, this is what we can use to read uh, the text when the user types something. So we will see how to uh, use this in a little while. Um, I will point out that these controllers in the starter project are defined up here. So we have one of them for each uh, text form field that we show uh, on the form. Finally, at the bottom, we have a, a sign up button, uh, which is defined uh, with like a, a color uh, for the background and a text color as well. Um, but as we can see, this is currently disabled. And that's because we are passing a null value to this unpressed callback. So um, this is where we actually start the workshop. And so our first goal is to uh, yeah, get started and add some code so that we can show a welcome screen when the user presses on this button. Um, so we're going to start adding some code now. And to do that, I'm going to just make a bit of space at the bottom. And over here, I'm going to start by adding a class. Uh, this will be called welcome screen. And we are going to extend uh, stateless widget. And this will be a fairly simple stateless widget class. Uh, just like any other widget, uh, what we want to do is to override the build method. So this is a method that returns a widget. Uh, it's called build. And it takes an argument of type build context, context. And inside here, we need to return a widget. So uh, all we want to do in this welcome screen is just to show a simple message in the middle that says welcome. So to do that, I'm going to start by returning a scaffold, which again gives us some additional uh, UI affordances uh, when we use a material design. Uh, this scaffold will have a body, uh, and this, and because we want the text to be centered, I'm going to use a center widget. And then inside it, I'm going to add a child. I can type it right, uh, which will contain a text widget. And in here, we can say welcome, like this. Uh, now, uh, the thing that we can do with text, uh, the most common thing that we want to do is to define a text style. So if we wanted, here we could hard code it and write something like text style with a font size of, for example, 32, which is uh, around the same size as, as this sign up button that we see here. Um, and actually, I forgot the that this is a named argument. So this is going to be called style, like this. So if we wanted just to get things up and running quickly, we can use this style. Uh, but in general, it's not a very good idea to hard code this. And instead, I think it's preferable to use one of the predefined styles uh, that come as part of the material design specification. So to do this, uh, we can do what is called inheriting a style. And to do that, we can type theme.of using the context that comes from this argument. And then we can type text theme. And then we can choose headline two, uh, which is a text style that is defined in the uh, subtle styles uh, that come with material design. So uh, what happens here is that uh, by typing theme of context, we are pulling a theme data object from the ancestor material app that lives up above uh, at the root of the widget tree. And then we get the text theme and choose to use headline two as the style. And in general, it's much better to define common, st common styles inside your material app and reuse them with theme of context as, they will, as this will make your styles consistent and easier to maintain. So uh, this is the welcome screen done. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, and the next step is that we need to wire it up to our signing button. 
So um, we're just going to do that now. Um, so yeah, to do this, we need to scroll back up to our flat button uh, that defines the sign up the sign up button. And what we want to do is to provide a callback uh, that is going to be called when the button the user presses on the button. So I'm going to type in a method name which is underscore show welcome screen. And this is a method that I have not created yet. So uh, what I want to do at this stage is to scroll back up and go above the build method. And here I'm going to add a new method, uh, which is void without a return type. This is called show welcome screen. And then inside here, I want to type navigator uh, of context dot push name. And then I'm going to use a named route. So I'm going to name this welcome like this. And, uh, and by doing this, uh, whenever the user presses on this button, we try to navigate to a route with this name. Uh, but we are not done yet. So what I'm going to do is to copy this route. And I need to define it all the way at the top where we have uh, the application level routes. So here I'm going to define a new route, which is a key value pair where the key is welcome. And the route is a, is a so-called widget builder. So this is a, takes a con gives us a context argument. And we can use this to return a welcome screen like this. So uh, at this stage, things are hooked up. So we can try to run the application once again. And this time, we can see that the sign up button already appears. And if we press this, uh, just pay attention here, the uh, welcome screen will slide in from the right. It was quite a quick animation. But yeah, by making an animation, uh, by making a navigation call like this, uh, Flutter will already do um, a transition between the previous screen and the new one that we want to show. And here we can see the welcome screen in the middle. Um, so um, this is good. Uh, however, <laughs> I got myself into a pickle because uh, all this screen does is show this message and it's not interactive in any way. So even if I run the program again, I can't really go back to, to the previous one, which is where we're going to do a lot of the work. So um, to get out of this problem, uh, a very quick way to do this is to add an app bar to our scaffold widget. So I can do that like this. And if I run this, I can see that Flutter adds a blue colored up bar at the top. And by default, it adds this back button. Uh, so this is all part of the default behavior that you get when you do navigation and, and navigate between from a route to a different one. Uh, so just for the purposes of, of going back to where we were, now I have this back button. And by pressing it, uh, the route is dismissed. And we can go back to the sign up screen. So uh, we are now able to present a welcome screen. And the next step that we want to, to do is to find a way to um, uh, basically have a, a progress indicator inside our form. So um, one thing that I haven't talked about yet uh, is that in this starter project, we have this variable called double form progress, uh, which is a state variable. Um, and what we want to do is to add a new method to this uh, widget class that will take care of updating the form progress whenever uh, the text changes inside any of these um, inputs. So as you can see, at the moment, I could type anything in into these inputs, but the linear progress indicator doesn't change its appearance. So the next step that we are going to do will enable us to start um, making uh, this uh, loading indicator change uh, whenever we fill up this field. So to do that, uh, we can find make some space over here. And then we can uh, start by creating a new method. So this will be a void method. And we're going to call this update form progress like this. And then inside it, we are going to start by defining a local variable called progress. And initially, we're going to set this to 0, 0.0. And the idea here is that we want to uh, iterate through uh, a list that contains all these three controllers. And we're going to check for each controller 
uh, if it has a text or not. And we are going to use that to, um, to, to modify the value of this progress variable. So, uh, and since we wanted to iterate, a quick way to do this is to group all the controllers together. So here I can type final controllers. And I'm going to assign this with a list, literal, actually just a list, which will contain these three variables. So I'm going to have uh, first name text controller, and then last name text controller, and I'm going to use the username text controller as well. So all we've done here is just to, to create a list object that contains these three. And now that we have it, uh, it, it's a little bit easier to go through each one of them and update the progress. To do that, we can use a for in loop. So I'm going to type for bar controller in controllers like this. And then inside here, I want to add a condition that says if controller dot value dot text dot is not empty. So this will tell me if uh, the controller that I'm currently looking at has a value has a value in it or not. Um, and if it is not empty, then I can say progress plus equals one divided by controllers dot length, like this. So the idea of this code is that uh, this progress value can have four possible values. It could be either be zero, or it could be one third, because controllers the length is three, or it could be two thirds, or it could be one. So now that we worked out what the progress should be, um, we need to um, find a way to, to use it to rebuild our widget. So to do this, we can make a call to a method called set state. And this is a method that is available if you are, if you are inside a Flutter state class, such as in this case. And what we want to do here is to use this set state call to assign our progress to our form progress state variable that is defined up above over here. So here we're just saying form progress equals progress like this. Um, so yeah, this will update the state. And then, uh, one sec, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we can, if we want, maybe try to run the program right now. But what we will find is that nothing seems to change at this stage. And that's because we have created this method, but we are actually not calling it anywhere. So what we want to be doing is um, find this form object over here. And then here we need to add an unchanged argument. And we're going to pass this update form progress method that we had just created. So the idea here is that this form uh, will receive an unchanged callback anytime any of these text, text fields changes. And that's because uh, this form is an ancestor for all these form fields that we have over here. So, um, so this is uh, good because we are now calling the form progress, and we, and and we, you can notice that uh, this linear progress indicator that we show at the top takes the form progress as a value. So, in theory, if we run the program now we should be able to start from an empty uh, linear progress indicator. But as soon as we start typing in, you can see that this has filled one third of the way. And if I add the, the last name, you can see that it's gone two thirds of the way. And if I add the username, if it's, it's filled all the way. And likewise, I can start deleting these text fields and it goes back to, to a progress of zero. So um, this is nice, uh, and I think one additional usability improvement that we could make is to only enable the sign up uh, button if all three um, text fields have a value. In other words, we could uh, go down here and we can modify this unpressed callback to only call the show welcome screen method if the form progress is equal to one. So here we can use the ternary operator to do this. And here we could type form progress equals one, and then question mark, show welcome screen, and then column null. So this is the classical ternary operator. And what we are doing in just one line is to check if the form progress is one, then we pass this callback 
to this argument, and if it isn't, it is no. So at this stage, uh, we can run the program once again, and we can see that when we start off, the sign up button is disabled, but as soon as I start adding my first name, last name, and username, then the button becomes enabled. Now, for this workshop, I should mention that we are not really doing any kind of fancy uh, validation of the input, and all we care about is you know, whether the each text field is empty or not empty. But if you want it, uh, you can kind of extend this and make it a little bit better, perhaps by adding a, a different kind of validator for each text field. So this is how we can um, enable conditionally the sign up button and add some logic to update the progress indicator. Now, the next step is to, um, to make this a little bit better using animations. So um, up until now, we have figured out that by using this linear progress indicator, uh, we can adjust the, the progress level uh, based on some state variable. Uh, but what we would like to do uh, to make it nicer is to add some animation so that the progress bar animates when the progress value changes. Um, and we would like to transition between different colors as we do so. Now, in Flutter, there are uh, many ways of dealing with animations. Um, and uh, one important distinction is the difference between in implicit and explicit animations. So implicit animations are ideal when you have an animation that always goes forward. For example, the hands of a clock. Uh, but there are cases where you want to be able to uh, pause and resume an animation or maybe make it go backwards. Uh, and in cases like this, you need an explicit animation. Uh, and because in this case, our progress bar can go forward and backwards and can be set to any arbitrary value, then we need an explicit animation. So uh, in order to control our animation, we need a so-called uh, animation controller which uh, we'll use to drive some animated properties depending on our uh, progress value. And in order to show the animations on screen, we will use a special widget, which is called an animated builder. Uh, and this uh, will become the parent of our linear progress indicator. And this builder will use the animation controller as the input. So I think that's enough theory for now. And, and so this is what we're going to do next. First, we will create an animated progress indicator uh, custom widget, which will take care of abstracting away all the animation logic that we are going to add. This will be a stateful widget, which will contain an animation controller. And we will use this to control the color of the progress bar. And it will use an animated builder to show the animation. So uh, we can get started. And so here, we can uh, type a, a new class, animated. In fact, let me just copy this. So we are going to create a, an animated progress indicator. This will extend stateful widget like this. And what we want to do is to give the progress value as a constructor argument to this widget. So here we're going to define a final double value variable. And then we're going to create a constructor. So to do this, we can define the constructor with this syntax. And then we want to uh, pass the value as a named argument. And we want to make it required so that the compiler can warn us if we forget to pass in this value. And Dart gives us this convenient way of uh, passing a constructor argument by typing this dot value, matching the name of the variable that we have defined over here. Then uh, there is a little bit of extra boilerplate code that you need to type when you create a stateful widget. So for now, I'm just going to paste this in here. Uh, and if you use uh, an editor like Visual Studio Code or Android Studio, there are quick code templates that you can just type, and it will fill up all the boilerplate for a stateful widget. Uh, but here I'm in Dartpad, so I'm just uh, pasting that in. Um, but the essential uh, thing to understand here is that whenever you define a stateful widget, you need to override this create state method uh, to return a subclass of state of stateful widget. So in this case, I'm returning this animated progress indicator state, which is a class that I define it, uh, down here. And this extends state of animated progress indicator, which is the name of the widget. 
So uh, if it's the first time you see this, uh, it might seem a little bit unusual, and I agree, there's a little bit of boilerplate code, uh, but this is something that you kind of get used to as you, as you work with uh, stateful widgets. So, uh, and as we said, uh, we were going to add an animation controller to this new class. So here I can type an animation controller, controller, like this. And then the next thing that I want to do is to override a method called init state. So this is a method that is called uh, by Flutter when this widget is inserted in the widget tree. And it is called only once before the build method. So it is a good place to run some initialization logic, such as creating our controller. So uh, it should, it's also good practice to call init state uh, so that yeah, we just call this the method of the superclass. And here we can start adding our initialization code. Uh, so this controller that we have declared here, we have not yet initialized. Uh, so this is a good place to do this. And we can type controller equals, and then animation controller. And then we can pass a duration argument, uh, which is a duration object. And this is something that uh, you can use to define an amount of time in Flutter. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to uh, say that the animation in our progress indicator takes, uh, say, one second, I could just say seconds of one. Or if you want to go more granular, you could say milliseconds and pass 1,200, for example. So this would be 1.2 seconds. This animation controller also takes a second argument, uh, which is called a vsync, which looks like this. And um, this is an argument that we need so that our controller can sync with the screen refresh rate on your device. So in Flutter, uh, this is done by saying this and, and calling the method like this. But uh, at the moment, we see that we get an error on the console. Uh, telling us that uh, our state instance class can't be assigned to the parameter type ticket provider, which is what vSync expects. And the reason we get that is that in order to enable this, we need to add a special mixing to this class. And this mixing is called a single ticker provider state mixing. I'm going to spare myself uh, the embarrassment of typing it by hand. Uh, but yeah, this is what you need. So um, by doing this, the error will go away, and you'll be able to create an animation controller that is linked to the refresh rate of the screen. So now that we have an animation controller, we need to start thinking about what we want to animate. So um, the next thing that we want to do is to define a variable that will uh, represent the transition between different colors. Um, and to do that, we, need, we can use uh, two classes, which are known as uh, twin sequence and twin sequence item. So down here, I'm going to add some code, and then uh, I can explain it. So to start off, we can declare a final color twin. And this needs to be an object, an object of type twin sequence, which looks like this. So the twin sequence takes a list of twin sequence item uh, objects as an input. And so here, we can start adding the first twin sequence item, and this has uh, two arguments. The first one is a twin, which in this case is going to be a color twin object, which has a beginning and an end. So the beginning could be a color, for example, colors.red, and the end would be uh, colors.orange, like this. Uh, it also takes a weight argument, uh, which, um, which we can use to control how much of the total animation duration is reserved for this item. So we'll see how this works and understand it a bit better when the code is complete. Uh, but for now, we can just give it a value of 1. And then we want to add two more twins representing the transitions between orange and yellow and yellow and green. So here I can copy this code and paste it here so that it stays inside this list. And the second 
uh, twin sequence item will start from colors.orange and it will finish with colors.yellow. And finally, we want to add the last one. And in this case, we can say colors.yellow and the end is going to be colors.green. Just to indicate that whenever all three form fields are complete, uh, then the progress will show a green color. Um, so uh, this twin sequence uh, will be used to animate across these different colors as the animation takes place. And the next thing that we want to do is to define two animation objects. So over here near the controller, we can create an animation of type color, and we can call this color animation like this. And we can also define an animation, this time of type double, which is a floating point number. And this will be called curve animation like this. And then we can scroll down after the color twin. And then over here, we can say color animation equals, and then we are going to use the controller that we have created to drive the animation. So we can say controller dot, uh, controller dot drive color twin. And then uh, here we can type curve animation equals controller. I think I have a typo here actually, so I'm gonna fix that. And then this is going to be controller dot drive and here we need to define an animation curve that we want to use. So to do that, we can use an object called a curve twin, which uh, uses a curve. And here we have various curves types that we can choose from. So for example, we could type curve curves dot. And if I type uh, the dot, I can see the list of all possible uh, easing effects that we can use uh, for our curve. So for example, the simplest one that we can use is uh, curves.linear. And for now, I'm just going to leave it like this so that we can see how a simple linear animation looks like. Okay, so this uh, kind of completes the setup for our animation code. Uh, and now we are ready to go and build the, uh, and implement the build method. So uh, at build method, so this will return a widget. It's called build, takes a build context, context argument. And inside here, uh, we are going to return an animated builder. Uh, and this is a widget that takes a, a couple of arguments. The first one will be an animation. And this is where we need to use our controller, which looks like this. And then it gives us a builder argument. Uh, and this exposes a context and a child. Now, in this case, uh, we don't actually need these two arguments. Uh, so maybe I'll give you a quick tip here. If you define a callback in Dart, and, and this gives you uh, some arguments, but you don't need to use them, you can reduce the amount of noise in your code by using another score. And uh, similarly, if you have two arguments, you can use two underscores, and this makes your code a little bit cleaner. And then we can use this builder to uh, return a linear progress indicator like this. Uh, and this will, after I fix the typos, should be fine now. So this takes a few arguments. The first one is a value. And uh, in this case, we are not really going to use the value that was passed uh, over here to the widget class, but instead we are going to be use the value that is animated. So here we can type curve animation uh, dot value like this. Uh, we also can pass in a value color, which will define how the color of the progress indicator looks like. So here we can pass the color animation and we can also define a background color, which will be uh, the same color animation, but this time we're going to get the value out of it. And then we're going to say with opacity, and for example, a value of 0 
So the uh, result of this is that the value that is not currently part of the progress will be slightly faded away. So um, this is how we can implement the build method, and this is how everything fits together. So um, we have a yeah we have an animated builder which uses our controller. The controller is what we use to drive the animations on this uh, widget on this, uh, sorry, animation object. And then we pass the animation objects themselves uh, to the linear progress indicator. And with this setup, we are, Flutter will be able to interpolate the values as the animator, um, as the animation controller uh, changes the progress values. Um, so before uh, we run, we need to go back to our widget at the top. Uh, and remember that at the moment, we are not using the animated progress indicator that we have just defined. So if we scroll up, we can find the first child of the column, and we're going to replace this with an animated progress indicator. Okay, so let's see how things are looking. So we can run the code at this stage, and we can see that the progress uh, bar looks pale red, which is the first uh, um, color that we put in our twin. Um, however, if we try to type into any of these fields, uh, it were not working. <laughs> Ooh, I think I managed to lock up there. OK. Yeah, so if we type into any of these form fields, we can see that the progress indicator doesn't actually update. Um, so, and the reason for that is that uh, nowhere in our code we are telling the animation controller to animate when the progress value changes. So up until now, we have been able to update this form progress variable. We called set state, and as a result, the widget is rebuilt, and we also pass the new form progress value to this uh, animated progress indicator. But if we take a look at the animated progress indicator itself, uh, this value is actually not being used anywhere just yet. So um, to hook things up, we need to uh, override one additional method, uh, which is a lifecycle method for the state class. So here I can type uh, void uh, did update widget. Uh, this is a method that takes an argument which is the old widget. We actually don't need this. So here we can just type super dot did update widget with old widget. So this is just a standard boilerplate. Uh, but the essential bit is that here we can call controller dot animate to, and we can say widget dot value like this. So this syntax uh, essentially pulls the value um, instance variable that is defined in the widget class. And in order to access it, we need to type widget dot, because here we are inside the state class. So uh, that's just a little trick. So if you are inside a state class and you need to call an object uh, variable that is inside the widget itself, you have to type widget dot. So uh, now that we have made this change, we should be able to uh, run the program once again. And now I can start typing. And you can see that as soon as I, uh, I change a text field so that it becomes not empty, the progress bar updates and goes from orange to yellow. And if I fill this one as well, it goes from yellow to green. And the whole animation uh, changes both the color and the level and the extent of the progress. Similarly, I can just delete uh, these text fields. And you can see that the form updates itself. So this is how we can do uh, explicit animations uh, using um, animation controllers and the um, animated builder uh, widget class. Um, like I said before, uh, we decided to uh, move all the animation logic inside a separate animated progress indicator class. Um, if we wanted, we could have made some changes directly to uh, this class itself, uh, but I think in general it's best practice to try to uh, kind of separate concerns. So what we are effectively doing here is to create a new widget class, uh, which will contain some custom animation logic, 
And by moving this into a separate class, we are making it reusable as well. So if we need to use it on a separate class or a separate widget, uh, we can do that as well. So this kind of completes our uh, workshop. Um, and just to summarize, uh, we started from a starter project, which was just a form with all the text fields and, and buttons not hooked up. We have seen how we can uh, show a welcome screen uh, using the Flutter Navigator API. And we have also enabled uh, validation by uh, enabling uh, a linear progress indicator. And we have seen how to, um, to use animations to make it look a little bit nicer. Um, and actually, we have covered quite a lot of concepts uh, in terms of what animations, what explicit animations are and how they work. Um, I think maybe after the workshop is over, we should be able to share some more links. Uh, the Flutter team actually has a very good playlist on YouTube that goes through uh, all the fundamentals of animations in Flutter. And so that's a good place where you can learn about uh, implicit animations. Uh, as well as explicit animations a bit more in detail. Um, so I may, I'll, I'll share the, the link to that uh, soon. Uh, but as far as we go, uh, this is the end of the workshop. Um, there's probably a couple of bits and pieces that I could have covered, uh, but maybe it's a good time to, to take some questions. And then if we have a bit more time at the end, maybe I can cover some, cover some additional bits. Um, so how, how are we doing with, with time, guys? I'm muted. There we go. <laughs> uh, we're at, I think, yeah, do perfect timing. So, um, so yeah, we're going to take some questions. Um, so I think I can take this first one I see here. And then Ryan, I think has been collecting some other questions that maybe I missed. Um, the, this first question is from Gondi in the, in the YouTube chat. Um, he said, uh, or they said, uh, I got confused on the weight of the tween sequence item. Why are they the same? Okay, so let me open up the twin sequence items. Right, so um, essentially what we want to do here is to define a, an animation, uh, but we don't just want to animate between uh, two values. Uh, what we can see is that every time, oops, deleting on the wrong side of the window, still doing it. I think the mouse cursor doesn't like me too much on the artboard. So yeah, the idea here is that we want to animate between different colors. And so one way that we can do this is to say, hey, Flutter, I want to have almost like a rainbow type of effect where I start from red and I go to orange and then from orange to yellow and from yellow to green. And what we can do is uh, this is actually I guess ideal for this kind of situation because we have exactly three text fields. And so by defining a three string sequence item, we take care of each uh, step individually. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, one thing that, for example, I haven't shown is that um, you know, when, you, when you drive the animation over here, we are driving the color and the curve twin as well. And we talked very briefly about curves. So at the moment, you can see that every time I change the input, if Flutter lets me, wow, DartPod and text field, interesting. Um, yeah, every time we change a, a text field and we remove it or add it, we increase by one third. But for example, here we could change the curve and say is in, which is a different type of curve. And um, by doing this, if we run the program again, we can see that as soon as we type, we only covered maybe 15% of the entire uh, span of the progress bar. And if we type a little bit more, we go maybe to halfway. And if we fill the last one, we go all the way. So by using different curves, you can modify the way you map from the uh, form progress, which is your actual input, to the output progress, which is what you see on screen. Hey, awesome. Uh, Ryan, do you want to take the next one? I'm just getting uh, the, uh, I'm getting these resources that you posted in the chat, which are really helpful. I'm just making sure we get these on the site for people and then I'll link it in the, in the video chat as well. The YouTube chat that is. Cool. Yeah. I have a couple other questions. Uh, Usman asks, is it possible to do a smooth animation of the linear progress indicator compared, compared to what we 
to here and how would it be achieved? Um, I guess um, maybe to answer the question with a question, what part of the progress uh, do we want to make smoother? Because like when you switch between each uh, text form field, at the moment, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like the way we configure the form is by having three discrete steps, and at the end of each step, uh, we decide that you know based on whether the text field is is filled or not, we increment by a given amount. Uh, so those three discrete steps are kind of fixed up front in the sense that you know each text form field is either valid or not valid. Uh, but I guess. Um, past that, maybe the question was about how do you uh, smoothen out things after that. So given that you have a, a value that is given as an input to the animated progress indicator, um, how can we, uh, I guess, change the way the progress changes so that it looks smoother? I mean, the... The only way that I can think of, of changing this is by modifying the curves parameter. Uh, so you can use, for example, I don't know, an exponential curve or a cubic curve. And if you do something like this, you might find that uh, the progress will stop at different points. So like here, for example, it's very, very short. And then the next one is, again, very short. And, and then it takes you all the way to the end. And maybe by playing with different curves, you might get different intervals. Um, but if the question was about some other um, parameter of the animation that we want to modify, um, it just depends on what you want to modify. I mean, we, we, with animations, it's very easy to interpolate between colors, curves, uh, a lot of different parameters. A lot of the parameters that you pass to many of the widgets that you use normally, like containers uh, that have a color, uh, a background color, text color, all those things are animatable. So it just depends on what it is that you want to animate and how you're going to, I guess, implement your logic for mapping between the input value and, and the output that you see on the UI. I think that answered his question. Uh, next question. Uh, Surya asks, if you could explain the difference between did update widget um, and did update dependencies. Did update widget and the other one was, sorry, did update? Uh, did update dependencies. All right, uh, good one. Uh, I might not be able to answer in an authoritative form <laughs> on this one uh, <laughs> because I actually haven't touched those for a little while. Um, I guess it, it, it's, it might be that Flutter gives you some fine grain control in terms of these two different callbacks being called at different points in time depending on who it is that is actually updated. Um, so maybe one of them works better for for changes that come from ancestor widgets. Maybe the other one works better for the parent. But I'm just going to stop here and not say anything more because I'm going into territory that I haven't seen in a little while. I think if you look at the documentation for the various life cycle methods, maybe it will be a little bit clearer. Awesome. Uh, Ryan, was that our last question? Yes, I believe that was the last question. OK, perfect. Well, I think that um, that wraps it up. I guess, Andre, is there anything? Where where should people find you online if you want to do like a plug? <laughs> where should they go next if they want to? I think uh, maybe the, the, there's three places. But I guess um, I'll just keep it on my website. Uh, so it's called weandrea.com. Uh, down here at the bottom, there's a site footer, and uh, you find a contact page. And here you can find, if you read through, you'll find my email uh, as well as my Twitter handle. And uh, for anything other than that, like all the videos are YouTube videos, so from here you can find my channel. Uh, so yeah, if you if you look at the contact form, you you'll find all the links that you need. Awesome, thank you, and we'll make sure to link the site here in the chat. 
um, yep. in just a couple of minutes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that we are going to take another probably five ish minute break, maybe five to 10 minutes, um, you know, bathroom break, coffee break, um, et cetera. And it looks like maybe there's one question that we didn't quite answer. So I'm going to say we we're, we'll pose that to Andrea like asynchronously and we'll get it in the chat here. Um, cause we want to make sure that we get the next workshop presenter ready to go. Yep. and stuff like that. So, um, so awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. And, um, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, everyone, uh, with the next workshop. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me.
All righty. I think that we are we're good to go. We're live. So we're here with our next workshop uh, presenter. Super excited about this one. And Ryan's going to go ahead and, and introduce him, and then we'll hop into it. Uh, awesome. So for our final workshop of the day, we have Eugene Satarov. And he is going to be teaching us about how to uh, use Flutter and Kotlin multi-platform um, to do some cross-platform development. He is a, a lead Flutter engineer at Surf Studio, and he's also a co-host of the Flutter Dev podcast. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me on the conference. I'm so happy to be here with you with a, a workshop. Uh, so, um, my name is uh, Evgeny Satorov, and I'm a Flutter team lead at Surf, uh, as Ryan already mentioned. Uh, and uh, let me share your screen first, because today we are uh, going to uh, go through live coding session. But first, I will tell you um, something about uh, to the current topic uh, we will cover today. And I have really small presentation uh, for 10 or 15 minutes on something about it. And then we will switch to Android Studio and we will do some uh, coding, um, uh, trying to implement something I uh, cover in my first part of uh, today's speech. So uh, give me a second to share screen. Oh, OK, so we will go full screen now. Yeah, uh, here on this slide, you can see my uh, contacts. You can find me on Twitter. You can subscribe. Uh, I, I write something about uh, Flutter uh, usually. And uh, you can also reach me out uh, through Telegram. Uh, you can write me directly, whatever you want, whenever you want, uh, if you have some questions on this talk or on Flutter in general. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm from Russia, from Voronezh. Uh, and, uh, Hello from Russia, everybody. We, here, we have uh, 9 p.m. now here. Uh, it is evening, so nice evening with you, guys. Uh, and let me introduce myself a little bit more, because in addition to my main job, I'm also a host of Flutter Dev Podcast. It is the only Russian uh, podcast about Flutter and everything was around it. Uh, and moreover, I'm a program committee of the largest mobile conference in Russia called Mobius. And um, feel free to apply your papers because we will be really happy to see all of you in Russia next year, maybe uh, if all this situation will be uh, okay. Uh, or this year, uh, November, we will go online. Mm, for the known, uh, because of known circumstances, and um, okay, feel free to apply your papers, guys. Uh, and finally, I'm Google Developer Group leader in my hometown in Voronezh. Uh, we are organizing meetups, workshops, uh, dev fests, and so on. You know about Flutter and uh, Android and everything. Uh, every Google technologies you may know. Uh, and a couple of words about my current company, about my employee, uh, because uh, Surf is a middle-sized mobile studio focusing on building quality mobile solutions for business. And we have many clients all around the Russia, and most of them are banks uh, and uh, other big companies. Uh, but what's really interesting that most of our history we made only native mobile applications, both Android and iOS, but we never had a single cross-platform application in our portfolio. Uh, but then Flutter appeared, and that's why we are talking about it today. Uh, and what we are going to talk about today, actually, uh, the happy news uh, that we do, won't talk about Flutter in general, because I suppose that everybody on this call, on this live, um, know something about this uh, modern cross-platform framework. That's good because we have more time to talk about really interesting things. I'm going to tell you about an interesting architectural solution, which was used by me in my own project. Uh, and the next step after this short presentation, we will write some code. We will implement this solution. Uh, I'll cover in the first part of my workshop, but I need to be honest, uh, and I need to tell you that uh, this 
uh, workshop, this talk is just a spin-off. Uh, initially, my talk was inspired by this guy, uh, Konstantin Skhavrebov. He's also Russian, um, and he's uh, from JetBrains team, uh, from Kotlin multi-platform team. And uh, he gave this talk uh, this uh, summer, this June, uh, during uh, Mobius, and uh, he fully covered all the important details about Kotlin multi-platform and its usage in practice. Uh, but uh, the bad news for you, sorry, uh, guys, that this talk was in Russian. So uh, I think you, you can hardly understand uh, something. Uh, <laughs> But if you're really interested in Kotlin multi-platform, I uh, strongly recommend you to watch some uh, English talks about it uh, from JetBrains guys. Uh, they talk in English a lot uh, and you can find it on YouTube uh, very easy. Uh, but in my workshop, I won't talk about Kotlin multi-platform a lot, uh, just about assembling the artifacts and uh, just about how to connect your Flutter application with the native libraries and what you can do with it and what benefits you can get from this uh, solution. Uh, so, okay, uh, today we are going to implement Flutter application with um, Flutter app on the top. Uh, with uh, domain and network layers based on Kotlin multi-platform technology. And uh, let's see what we will get in the final stage. Uh, here you can see uh, some, some nice animation. Um, that, that is what our application will look like. As you may notice, it's really, really simple. Just two screens. Uh, authentication screen uh, with implementation based on WebView and uh, the GitLab projects list. Uh, and there is also a log logout button on uh, this screen that allows you to drop your session now and uh, to get out to the auth screen again. And that is all. Uh, and that's enough uh, to show you all the benefits of such a cross-platform solution. Here you can see the structural diagram of our architectural solution. Uh, that's really important that we have two layers, two different layers based on different technologies. Uh, the first layer, uh, called Flutter application, is just a simple uh, Flutter application, uh, contains only Dart code, and it's pretty lightweight as it, it, has, uh, it has only UI-related code and uh, some presentation code. Uh, but uh, the business logic layer is just a proxy between the Dart code and the native library model. Uh, and that native model is implemented uh, based on Kotlin multi-platform technology. Uh, and here you can see the second layer, uh, which I called SDK for simplicity. Uh, and what you can find inside this SDK? Uh, actually, you can find a code responsible for a lot of different complex things, uh, for networking, for data caching, for session handling, for uh, and even all entity models that you can um, use in your application uh, during um, some uh, actions with your uh, service, uh, GitLab. Um, you can find here in this layer, and uh, all of this logic on all of these classes are right um, with the usage of Kotlin multi-platform. And for sure, when it comes to the native libraries, we should we should not forget about differences which supported operation systems bring to, brings to the stage. Uh, for Android, we need first to build. AAR library, Android library, uh, to use it in our Flutter application. But uh, for iOS, it can be just a usual iOS framework. And I need to uh, attend you that we, uh, during our uh, workshop, uh, and we have not so much time, just about one hour, uh, we will cover only uh, Android part, but uh, on uh, one of the uh, next slides, you can find QR code, you can scan it, and you can follow through it uh, to the GitLab repository, and you can find uh, this project we will uh, implement today. Uh, and uh, this project is ready to be built for 
Android and for iOS both. And if you will be really interested in this topic, you can uh, keep in touch with this project and try to do something by yourself with it. Uh, okay, and um, by the way, we have uh, one more option for Android. We can uh, use our Kotlin multi-platform library, our model, uh, just like a simple Gradle project uh, without building uh, artifacts like AAR library. Uh, we can just include all the library sources to our project and apply our uh, Gradle project to our uh, application. Uh, but uh, I need to tell you about uh, what can help you to assemble the artifact for Android and for iOS uh, because it's really uh, fascinating. It's really simple. You can use uh, Gradle uh, for both Android and iOS. Uh, you can use uh, these simple terminal tools uh, like assemble debug and assemble release that you can run on our SDK model. Uh, and here, on, uh, following this path, you can find uh, artifacts after the build uh, stage will be over. Uh, what about iOS? Uh, not, um, not so hard at all, because uh, you can use uh, another Gradle uh, commands like pack for Xcode. Uh, and you can find uh, ready to use uh, um, iOS frameworks uh, in this directory in your project. Uh, okay, so uh, I need uh, to talk a little bit more about how to write custom, plat uh, custom platform specific code, because as you may know, there is only one way to do it in Flutter and um, this way called platform channels. Uh, you know that uh, your typical Flutter application consists of two parts, the Flutter portion itself and the hosts, the platform hosts, Android host and iOS host. Uh, these two parts communicate uh, through some kind of a bridge uh, called platform channel. Uh, the Flutter portion of the app sends uh, messages to its host, uh, the iOS or Android portion of the app over a uh, platform channel. So, uh, but uh, on the other side, the host listens um, on, on the app, um, on the platform channel and receives the message. Uh, and um, in then, uh, it then calls into any number of platform specific APIs using a native programming language. Uh, and uh, you can send a res response back to the client uh, to the Flutter app, and uh, using platform channels, it looks like not so hard to do. Uh, but uh, on the client side, uh, you need uh, to remember one important thing, that you need to pay attention that on each platform you need to use a special class with this unique name. Uh, for Android, uh, you need to use um, uh, method channel class, uh, and for iOS, you need to use Flutter method channel class. Uh, but uh, actually, they are pretty alike, and they have uh, common APIs, so um, it's it, it not so huge differences uh, between them. Um, but uh, the bad part that you need to write some boilerplate code to um, help your uh, host and your Flutter application connect to each other. Uh, okay, so the last step before uh, our live coding journey begin. Uh, take a look at this architectural diagram one more time. We will take a half-finished project as a basis and will continue its implementation during our live coding session, uh, facing all the challenges that come to our way. So, uh, you can scan this QR code uh, and uh, download this project uh, to your laptop or to your desktop, uh, whatever you use. Or you can do nothing and you can just enjoy our live coding session. Uh, it's up to you. But I need to switch uh, to my Android Studio. Uh, as you may notice, I have two 
instances of Android Studio because we need both Android presentation of our project and uh, Flutter presentation of our project. And the easiest way to do it is to open just uh, two uh, instances of Android Studio at one time. Uh, but first, before we will start to write some code, I need to um, walk you through the project, through the project structure, and to show you what we have there. Uh, we have there two important folders, one called Flutter app. Uh, here you can see that Flutter app is just a simple Flutter application with the usual file structure, with pubspec YAML file, with Android, iOS, and lib folders, and so on. Nothing unusual at all. But uh, another interesting part is SDK folder. I think uh, that it's pretty straightforward that SDK is Kotlin multi-platform library, uh, ready to usage, and um, uh, okay, what we what we can find here. First of all, of course, uh, there are a lot of entity models. Uh, all of these are Kotlin files. Uh, just for example, we can look uh, through these files and uh, find something interesting like project. This is uh, GitLab project representation. You can find here a lot of different fields. Uh, you can find serializable annotations and so on. It's just a simple Kotlin data class. If you know something about Kotlin, you may understand that uh, this is like Pojo class. Uh, what's more, we have uh, different interactors here. Uh, we will use these interactors to uh, different purposes, really to different purposes, because some of them uh, are useful for uh, retrieving data from the networking, uh, from the server. We can um, download some project list, for example, and so on. Uh, some of them, like session interactor, can help us with uh, the uh, access token storage, uh, or we can check if the user has uh, active uh, session uh, right now at this moment, in every moment of the project uh, of our application uh, life cycle. So uh, there are a lot of um, interesting business logic things here on this layer, and even some uh, util classes, uh, which can help us with some, uh, some in, in some scenarios, uh, for example, just reaching the network uh, or coding something and coding something and uh, and so on okay uh, that's i think that's enough to know about our kotlin multi-platform library uh, and we can go to um to our android uh, project presentation because now uh, we need to uh, include our uh, kotlin multi-platform model to our project uh, for that purpose, we need to go to our settings Gradle file. Uh, and what, what, what should we do next? We need to include, uh, okay, let me uh, make the font a little bit bigger for you. We need to include our model. And I know that uh, it's called SDK. Uh, but um, in case that this model um, is not in this project uh, folder. We need to specify the path uh, to this folder. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky. The first time you doing it because it's not what you um, probably do every day in, the, in your Gradle file configurations. Uh, but uh, we need to find our SDK folder I know that it's uh, two steps uh, from our uh, Gradle file. Okay, that should be enough. Uh, and then we need to sync our project. We need to resync our Gradle configuration to be sure that our SDK model 
is a part of our project now. Okay, uh, that's good. The next step, we need uh, to allow our project to reach out the source code of our SDK model, because it's not enough for that. We need to uh, add our implementation dependency to our dependency block in our build Gradle file of our application. Uh, we will navigate to the build Gradle file and we will write this uh, simple line. Uh, we need to specify implementation on project, which is called SDK. And we, and we need to resync our Gradle configuration again, once again, and uh, it's kind of fast because we have not so large projects and we have not so much dependencies. Uh, so that's, that's ready for the work. We, uh, right now, at this moment, we need to have access to our source code of our Kotlin multi-platform library from our Flutter application. And uh, now let me uh, navigate to our main activity. Our main activity extends from the Flutter activity and is just uh, the usual activity that you have uh, from the start in every new Flutter application you can create with your terminal uh, or with your Android Studio or whatever you like. Uh, but uh, we have some more complex logic here in this class because we need uh, to uh, to handle this communication between our Flutter application and between our uh, native Android host. And uh, we are going to do it in this method called configure Flutter engine. We need to override it and we need to declare our handler. Uh, and to be true, this is the most boring part of this workshop because you need to write really huge amount of uh, boilerplate code. Um, and that's the sad part of it. But uh, first, you need to pay attention to set right uh, name for your platform channel here, because uh, this platform channel, we, uh, you need to instance, instantiate on your Android side and on your Flutter side. And uh, the most important thing uh, is uh, that name should be uh, the same for both instances. The, uh, this is uh, the only ability uh, to make them communicate with each other. Uh, okay, so uh, we will continue setting our handler. Uh, don't be afraid of it because uh, you need to specify this handler only one once, uh, but then uh, for all your uh, methods, you should call from your Flutter side, uh, but all, for all your native methods, uh, you need to uh, add one more line in this when construction. Thanks, Kotlin, for that. Uh, we need to take our call instance and we need to get out method from it uh, because when we do some invocation from the Flutter side uh, through our method channel, uh, we need to specify the method we are going to call. And in this when construction, we should map each method we need to uh, support in our application with uh, the method implementation itself. Okay. Uh, that really uh, looks ugly because you can't validate it in runtime and you can just make typo in this uh, method name easily because we are all people, uh, we are not machines. Uh, and you will get some strange errors. You need uh, to debug a lot just to find this typo. Uh, but the good news is that you can uh, use Pigeon for that. Uh, I recommend you to pay attention at this library called Pigeon. It's kind of new and it's in pre-release stage now. Um, maybe 
breaking changes may occur. They mentioned it here in the description. But uh, this library is a code generator tool uh, and uh, it can make this communication between Flutter and host platform type safe and easier and that's really so uh, and I recommend you to, to try it out. But today uh, we are going to make it by our own hands. We have seven platform methods here. Yeah, we, uh, but uh, not all of them are uh, the same because they have really different signatures. Some of them uh, need only result uh, instance. Some of them need uh, both call and result. And I will uh, describe you why uh, in a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, boring enough, but uh, the most interesting part we're waiting for you uh, in a minute because we will try to implement some of these methods. You can th see the gaps here in the method implementations and these uh, methods are quite different between each other. I prefer to copy paste uh, all these method names just to avoid typos that I can make accidentally. Okay. And one more time. And what if uh, the developer will try to call some method that we don't mention here in our event construction? Uh, then we need to specify some else branch. And when we can use a result not implemented method, which can help you to handle a call to an unimplemented method as, as the documentation uh, tells us. Okay, that's enough. Hope you had fun during implementation of this configure Flutter engine method and now we are ready to uh, handle uh, our platform method calls from our Flutter side to our Android side. Uh, and now we are ready to implement now we're ready to switch to our uh, another Android Studio instance. Uh, we need to find a splash road state class. And we uh, first thing we need to do is to instantiate method class instance. Uh, you can save it to static const variable called platform. Uh, and it's kind of simple because we need just call the constructor of method channel class. And uh, I, I've already mentioned that we need to specify the name. Uh, this name is actually the same as this one. It's really important. Uh, check it out twice on your own implementations. Okay, we're ready to use our method channels. Uh, and uh, first of all, we need to implement has account method. This method uh, is in a part of our splash screen because we need to know where we need to navigate user after the splash screen will disappear. Uh, if the user has account, if the user was logged in previously, we need to navigate it to the, uh, our project list screen. And uh, in the opposite case, uh, if 
he has no logged in account, uh, we need to show authentication screen. And it's kind of simple because uh, we need to do nothing on our Dart side. Uh, all session handling logic, all networking logic, uh, all implemented on the Kotlin multi-platform model side. And all we need to do is to make just a simple invocation to our platform method. Uh, and it's and it's really simple because we need to uh, use our platform instance, and this platform instance has one uh, handy method called invoke method. And this me invoke method uh, accept string variable, string argument, and this string argument is the Uh, platform method name actually, uh, but we, we, we need to remember that uh, all platform invocations through our method channels are asynchronous operations and we need to handle it uh, like this. We don't forget about a wait keyword. Uh, another important thing that we need to cover all our platform invocations and to try catch uh, construction because we need to um, check uh, properly if uh, there are any errors during the this invocation during our communication with platform because uh, everything can can happen and you can just make some people and uh, trying to reach out to uh, uh, an existing vendor and nothing will happen. Okay, so, uh, but in our implementation, we'll do nothing because it's just a simple implementation for our workshop. Uh, okay, so uh, we need to return has account from our method and it's done. Uh, that was not so hard, but um, the next step will be on the Android side. We need to get back to our main activity. Uh, we see some unimplemented method. Uh, for example, get allowed URL. Uh, this method should provide our Flutter applications URL for OAuth, uh, just to have an ability to show right page in a web view. Uh, and it's not so hard at all because uh, all complex logic already implemented in our Kotlin multi-platform libraries. We need just to get session interactor from it and to get our CRL. Uh, then we need to use let operator uh, just to be uh, sure to that, that this OAuth URL exists, that it, it is not now, uh, not empty, and we need to pass this result to our method channel uh, because we pass this result instance as an argument of our method get OAuth, and we, and we can use it to return our values from our native uh, model uh, using success method. But what if it would be no success? Uh, what if we get uh, we'll get error uh, during this operation? What if our CRL will be now? Uh, then we need to specify this error. Uh, just to be able to handle it on our flat, flatter side. Uh, maybe we need to show some error state or snack bar or something of this kind. It's up to you. We need to provide some meaningful message just to help other developers easy un to understand, easily understand that uh, something, something wrong with our code yeah, and that is all. That's done. And then we need 
to implement another method. And it is a little bit more interesting because we have not only result that we need to pass from Android side to our Flutter application, uh, we have also arguments that we pass from Flutter application down to our Android host because we need uh, to check our uh, URL for redirections. Uh, and if you come to the case when you need to um, get some arguments from your Flutter application to your Android host, uh, you need to use this method called instance that you can pass to your method. Uh, and you can get all past arguments from this call instance, from this method called instance. That's uh, rather simple, but uh, not so type safe. And uh, I still can recommend you to uh, look to the pigeon library just to solve this problem. But right now uh, we will write uh, something of this kind. Oh, my mistake. Argument instead of arguments. Uh, and okay, that we need to check this URL using our session interactor. Session interactor is a part of our Kotlin multi platform SDK. It has already uh, implemented ability to check this URL and to get uh, just a Boolean uh, result uh, that we can use easily. And we need to pass this result uh, and we need still to check if this result is not now. Uh, but after that, uh, if everything is okay with our result, we can just uh, return it to our Flutter application using the result success. And of course, we need to hand, we, we, we should not forget uh, to handle this error. Okay, that's done. Check out, uh, check out the redirect method is implemented successfully. Uh, and uh, then we need to go to our Dart application. Okay, let, let me uh, check myself out. Yeah. Uh, no, we need to continue uh, to add some uh, lines of code to our Android module, to our Android host. Uh, we have uh, retrieve projects list here, and um, we get to we, we get to the uh, most important problem, uh, really unpleasant problem because uh, we cannot uh, pass uh, we, we can pass primitive types. Uh, through our method channel between Flutter application and uh, native applications, uh, native hosts, uh, but we c uh, it is really hard to pass some complex data structures between them uh, because we need to write uh, some uh, we need to write some code just to uh, serializing and deserializing it back because uh, we need uh, to make it into, uh, to convert it into strings. Uh, and here we need to pass our projects list from our SDK to our Flutter application to show our projects on the screen. And our projects are really complex structure with a lot of different fields. Uh, not, of, not all of these fields are primitives. Some of them are uh, really custom classes. Uh, and it's really tricky to pass all these projects to our Flutter part uh, without making some overhead. Uh, but we can use uh, Xon library, which I uh, already add to our 
Android host um, just to convert our projects list to JSON. Uh, but the bad news is that we need to convert it again back to uh, projects list on the dot side. Uh, and that looks like overhead, but uh, we have really few ways to act ourselves in this situation. Thanks to Xon that uh, it's really easy operation to convert that complex uh, lists of projects to just a single string. And then we will pass this string using our result success method. Yeah, uh, that is all. But uh, the next step is to convert it back. Uh, because on the Dart side, uh, we will have a project representation model. Uh, and uh, here we need to Im implement some uh, JSON mapping for our project class. Uh, I think that is more usual for the typical Flutter developer to see something like this. Uh, we need to pass a map typed with string and dynamic, uh, the typical representation of JSON. Uh, and then we need to map uh, all of our fields to the, to the fields of our class. You need, uh, um, you can see that this class is uh, a lot of, a lot simpler than uh, project uh, data class in our multi Kotlin multi-platform SDK. Uh, just for the simplicity, we don't need uh, all of the fields that we have in our SDK, but we can add some more fields if we will need to use it in the future. Yeah, that's enough. We have only three fields. We have an ID, we have a name. Uh, this is actually a project name. And we have avatar URL uh, to have an ability to show uh, uh, avatar of our project in our projects list. And now we can use uh, from JSON function to map our uh, projects from our SDK to our dot uh, models. Uh, we need to move to the next step. Uh, this step is called uh, retrieve projects list because here we uh, involve we should invoke our platform method with uh, which was implemented previously. Uh, this uh, method will retrieve some projects for us from uh, GitLab API. Uh, first of all, we need to get uh, the raw JSON with all of our projects. Oh, um, I probably I forget to instantiate this method channel here. Let's copy paste it from another screen. Just not to spend your time. Okay. Mm. Something wrong with the import. Now we can use our platform instance to invoke platform method. 
and we need to uh, check it twice so that there are no differences between this method name and uh, this method name that we uh, mentioned here in our invoke method arguments. Okay. In this line, we should have our project's JSON uh, instantiated. But then we need to uh, we need to decode our JSON first. And after that, we are ready to transform our uh, JSON to our dot project. objects We can use map function to map every function uh, to the project representation uh, with the usage of our new from JSON function. And that, uh, then we need to use to list function to collect all of our projects to the single list. That's enough. Uh, here we should have instantiated uh, projects list. And then we need to do one important thing. We need to refresh our projects in our widget state. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, uh, that's wrong state. It's my fault. We need to specify a set state method implementation here. Uh, and we need to uh, turn off all the error flags here and loading flags also, but we need to set our projects variable here because here we all uh, we will already have instantiated projects list. Okay, let's check what we have in our Flutter dot analysis and. Uh, it looks like everything is okay. And probably we are ready to try it. For that purpose, I will show you the emulator. This is Android SDK emulator. Hmm. We need to wait a couple of seconds, maybe 10 or 20 seconds uh, to let it be built. Mm 
installation. Oh, okay. Uh, we can see some kind of splash screen. And uh, here you can see web view. We just check in our browser. Uh, and here it is. Our platform communication works perfectly well because we see this web view and we uh, really need to uh, try to log in. I will use my account to show you the ability of this application. Yeah, and that's done. Uh, we are right now. We are we are looking to, uh, on the projects list screen. Uh, here I have one project, and we can log out using this button. And all the uh, operations uh, we can do, we can see in this application, uh, are based on Kotlin multi-platform library because all the network operations, all the uh, session handling operations. Uh, we uh, use only from our Kotlin multi-platform library and uh, you can't find any business logic code in our dot part. Uh, okay, is it good or is it bad? Is, uh, you should decide for yourself uh, because if you have only a one single Flutter application, uh, it may be a little bit overhead because uh, you need to pass all this data between Flutter and uh, Android and iOS application and uh, sometimes it can be tricky enough. But uh, if you already have a cross-platform SDK uh, like I have in my project uh, and a lot of different clients uh, not only Flutter applications or Flutter web applications or desktop applications and so on, but on completely different technologies. You can uh, still use uh, Kotlin multi-platform for that because you can compile your Kotlin multi-platform model actually for everything. Uh, and you can uh, develop all your uh, networking and uh, all your data logic, uh, all your model, uh, all your models and entities, uh, only ones, and uh, that's why I called my workshop cross-platform squared. Uh, okay, so if you have any questions about it, you can uh, text me. Uh, feel free to text me uh, through Telegram or uh, through Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, uh, thank you for having uh, this good time with me. Thank you for being with us until the end. Welcome to the Dart side. Thanks, everybody, for enjoying my workshop. Hey, thank you so much. That was awesome. Do you want to... Well, maybe we'll leave the screen sharing open for just a minute or so, just in case... Uh... I don't know. When you do, well, I guess if we need to go back to the the code, you can do that. I guess that's not in the slides, but if you want to keep the screen sharing up, um, yeah, I was trying to. I don't know if we have any questions. Ryan, did we miss any, or did I miss any questions? No, uh, I didn't see any questions. I guess your okay. talk must have been so awesome that you know everybody understood everything. Yeah. So what? Hope we, so. Yeah. What we will do is we'll. Um, We'll look for, uh, we'll get like your resources. I'm knocking things over on my desk. We'll get your resource list. Um, if you have one, we'll put it in the, uh, like on the post on our website. So, you know, the slides code and stuff like that, we'll make sure to, to link on our website. Um, we got a comment from Surya who says, thanks for presenting. So maybe there is no questions. It's just thanks and that it was awesome. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's cool. Um, where can people, I guess you linked on the slides, do you want to put the slides back up again or just to summarize? So you're on Twitter, um, and we've tweeted at you today. So people can find that too. And then you have a telegram. That's fun that people can just text you on telegram. I like that. I don't know if I'm brave enough for that, but, <laughs> but I like that you have it. That's fun. 
Um, is there, do you have any, anything else you want people to check out or is there, are those the two best places to, uh, reach out to you? Uh, yeah, I will provide you all the links, uh, for the, uh, for, for my slides and, uh, for GitLab repository with this project. And you can check out, uh, not only Android implementation, uh, which I show you during my workshop, but, uh, iOS implementation. Uh, sure. for all the, who are interested in this because we just simply have no time today to uh, talk yeah. about both. Uh, for sure. Cool. All righty. Sounds good. Oh, I am leaving the start menu open on the stream. Awesome. <laughs> good at computers. All righty. Well, I think, yeah, we'll make sure we get that up. And I think then with that, uh, this concludes our workshops for the day. So, um, yeah. So thank you, Eugene. Thank you to Felix and to Andrea as well for joining us. Um, this is really awesome. And just in case someone came to the stream late or anything like that, or had to drop out, um, it's just a YouTube stream. You can go back and rewatch it. Um, it, I think the way that YouTube works normally is it'll probably like disappear for like an hour as they process it. Um, uh, but then it'll come back and you can rewatch, you can rewind and we'll make sure that all of the resources, um, or the links to each workshop, um, that we put that in the description of the video as well. Um, yeah, I don't know, Ryan, do you have anything else to add on that topic? No, no, again, thanks everyone who attended. Thanks everyone who asked questions. I'd like to thank the speakers as well. And we look forward to seeing everybody here again tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, so on that note, um, yeah, make sure to tune in. We'll start at the same time tomorrow, 11 a.m. CST, which I think is 4 p.m. GMT, if I remember correctly. Um, I'll make uh, make sure we have another link to the schedule uh, in the live chat. So yeah, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll be starting with a Q&A tomorrow, which should be really cool, um, with Chris Sells and Valeria. Ooh, can't remember her last name. Um, but just two awesome people in the Flutter community. I know people have been tweeting at us that they're really excited to have them, uh, you know, have them answering questions and stuff like that. So so yeah, keep an eye out for that and uh, make sure to join our Discord in the meantime if you haven't, where we'll be chatting and dropping these resource links and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to figure out how to end the stream successfully. Uh, thank you, Eugene, again for joining, and uh, we'll catch you all tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, have a good day tomorrow. Yeah, thank have you. A good conference. Let's see here.